Hello and welcome to what promises to be an absolute highlight of the festival. It's my enormous pleasure today to introduce Sir David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg in conversation. They are both separated in age by 77 years, but they're united with a passion and determined to try and help solve the planetary crisis. Um, Greta, where are you today? Where are you speaking from? I'm speaking to you from my couch in Stockholm. <laughs> Very comfortable. How about you, David? I'm at home uh, in Richmond, uh, just uh, in West London, close to Richmond Park. Well, the plan this morning is that I say as little as possible. Um, but I would like to start off, David, with the opening question to you, please. Um, you've been recording and filming The Natural World now for over 70 years. I just wonder when the moment was when you first realised, when you first saw evidence that the natural world was in trouble. Well, I probably saw it and didn't recognise it. Um, you, you look at a glacier and you can't tell whether it's, unless you've been there before, whether it's coming or going. But, um, but the first time that I had incontrovertible demonstration of, of something awful uh, was on a coral reef. I, I first dived on coral reefs in the 50s. I'm, I'm no sort of an underwater swimmer. I, I can use a scuba gear, but n not much. But I remember the first time I dived on a reef in the 50s, I thought it was the most extraordinary, wonderful paradise of variegated life that I'd ever seen in my life. Every colour in the rainbow, all kinds of animals, you had no idea what they were. I mean, of course, you saw fish, which are fish like you'd never seen before, and then all kinds of organisms. And then, and I suppose this must have been oh, 20 years ago, uh, I've been coming and going on the Parry Reef all the way since then, and I dived in, just off Lizard Island it was, I think, um, and suddenly, instead of this pageant of wonder, it was like a cemetery. I mean, quite literally, because all the coral was white. It was dead. And suddenly I realised that what I'd heard about coral breaching was actually happening and actually real and, and devastating. That was the first time that I was absolutely convinced that something really appalling was happening in the natural world. And Greta, can I ask you a similar question? Um, when was it that you first, as a, a young child, realised that you had to do something and devote your long life to f um, fighting the climate crisis? First, when I became aware of it and became worried about it was I was maybe eight years old. And that's when I started to feel worried about it. But then I started to read up about it more and more uh, during a few years and during that time I slowly r realized that this is something I need to do something about because it felt it felt like no one else was doing anything about it and someone needed to do something about it and that someone could be me so I thought that then I need to do something it is my since I have seen this I've seen and I I've understood what happened and no one else seems to understand and take it seriously, then I have some kind of moral responsibility to to do something about it. Well, that's absolutely astonishing. Uh, much less of a dramatic stimulus than mine um, and that you recognise that. Uh, so you, what you did was to start striking, wasn't it? Was that once a week? Uh, first, it was every day. For three, okay. for three weeks up until the Swedish election. And then after the Swedish election, I decided to continue once a week. And how long have you been doing that for now? I think yesterday was week 112. Well, it, it's obviously working. I mean, it was sensational uh, that you started that. Uh, and your image has gone round the world and your dedication has gone round the world. Have you had evidence that it's actually working, that particular policy of yours? I guess that question has many different answers. In one way, yes, it has shown that it has led to some kind of change since, since it has, among many other things, led to an increase of awareness and uh, concern among the public. And that, but also in one way, it hasn't, I mean, it hasn't led to, we still aren't treating the crisis like a crisis. And of course, 
that change can't just come from one thing like that. That needs everyone to work together and to to push. So, um, but, but there was a switch from being just doing it um, in Stockholm and then doing it on the world stage. What was the first time you did it on the world stage? Uh, well, first it was it was only in Stockholm. We were a few people, and then it started started spreading to other Swedish cities. Like people stood outside the um, the municipality buildings, or and so on. And then it started spreading to other countries. The first country was um, the Netherlands, and then I think it was Finland, and and so on. And then it just took off from there. And I think one. One tipping point was when Australia started striking. That was massive and that really got out in the media. And then people saw that, young people saw that and said, I want to do the same thing. I think many young people are concerned about these kinds of issues, but they don't know how to express that concern and how to to turn that feeling of of sort of that they feel desperate into actually doing something. And I think many were given some kind of tool to to actually turn those feelings into into something concrete to do. Spreading it to um, America must have been an extraordinary thing to do. Uh, certainly when I read about it, I, I was hugely impressed that you decided to stick to your principles and not burn carbon in sitting in an aeroplane. Uh, but to do it in a in a, a yacht, uh, um, and and that's that's hard going, isn't it? I mean, wasn't it hard? It's it's not like I I didn't have a choice. I choose myself to be there, and it was an incredible opportunity which many people don't get to to experience. So I saw it as as just a unique opportunity and an amazing experience. So I didn't see it as something that was hard or um, or difficult. I I really enjoyed that sailing trip because I was so lucky to be to be there. But most people haven't been able to to experience that and they haven't seen the consequences of of what is happening to to the natural world even though I mean with your help you've you've um, su- uh, succeeded in spreading that awareness, but still it isn't the same thing as experience it yourself. Do you, do you feel like since you have experienced it and seen it with your own eyes, does that come with some kind of responsibility to speak up, to try to to defend to defend it? Yes, it certainly, of course it does. Um, and the in, in the curious way, I, I experienced something which no responsible person really could now experience which is of actually being totally cut off you with with no kind of email no kind of connection with the outside world uh, entirely on your own uh, um, I mean I've done that in in New Guinea um, and and I've done it in Borneo too uh, and and that is something Quite other when, but it only matters what you're going to do today. It only matters whether it's going to rain or not. It only matters whether you've got on the last bag of rations or not. Um, and uh, an, if something, if you fell over and broke your leg, that's it. I mean, I mean, well, you'd have to get back somehow, but um, nobody would know where you were, and that—that's a feeling. It's a loss, really. It's—it's it's an experience which. Which I had never forgotten, um, and nobody could, nobody responsibly <laughs> can do that to themselves these days. Um, th- moving on to something else, H- have you heard about the Earthshot Awards? Uh, I have heard of it. I'm not very, I have not read about it that much. But could you explain about it a bit more? Yes. Well, um, this is Prince William's idea. Um, it's saying to the public at large, and uh, I suppose it's in Britain, but I'm not sure whether it's international, but certainly it's in Britain, of saying, if you've got a great idea, um, together with, about the problems in the earth or the sky or the sea uh, or on conservation or on how to deal with plastic, uh, there will be a, a million pound award for every one of those things if, if, that's going. 
And um, I'm wondering whether, in fact, that's the sort of thing that you think might help in this procedure. I think, yeah, definitely. Initiatives like that are great. We need we need everything right now. All the initiatives that will help get us in yeah. the right direction is good and are needed. Um, it feels like today we, 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 we talk about either we need to do these things, either individual change or either voting or either demonstrating people seem to forget that we need to do all these things simultaneously. And so, so yeah, all these initiatives need to be um, encouraged. You know, you have to be a very, very broad based scientist to understand climatology and ecology and marine science and the physics of how you deal with, with plastic waste or these things. Um, but um, so it, it, it's tough. Um, this this our conversation is is going out in wild screen uh, which is um i think the first wildlife film festival which started in bristol quite a long time ago um do you think this this sort of conferences like like the one we're taking part in now actually help i think it definitely could it's it's a big opportunity to 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 be able to change things um, the the way that got me into the climate crisis, the thing that in, introduced me to the climate and environmental emergency was films about the natural world and what was happening. So films and movies have have an extraordinary power to to open up our eyes, and um, so uh, yes. th that's also, I mean. And that's what you have been doing. You know m more about this than anyone. Um, I mean, do, why do you think that is? Why do you think that films and movies have such power over us? And uh, and I just I just saw your film, your new film, and um, it was amazing. And so I I thank you very much for doing it and and uh, for making it. Um, what I mean, why do you think films have such power? Well, there's nothing. Uh, there's, there is no way of conveying reality as as uh, impactful uh, as as these sort of pictures. I mean, you've only got to show going back to the coral reef. You've only got to show a picture of a coral reef you know, with turtles and all the rest of it, and it takes your breath away. And if it moves and it's in colour, uh, it it is so impactful. What I'm astonished by is that, of course, um, the United Nations tell us that that the majority of the human race are now living in towns to some degree, are now urbanized. I mean, they're cut off to some degree from the natural world. And yet the paradox is that now, because of television worldwide, um, everybody uh, can get a picture of the, of the wild world in a way they never did before. My, my father never, would never have heard of a pangolin, for example. I mean, and now you, you, talk to anybody in the street, they'll know what a pangolin is. And so it is this strange business that, that, that people are cut off from nature and yet happily know more about it than they ever did, had the opportunity because of, of what we're, the festival, this, our conversation is going out. The people there, they have been responsible for doing this. So it's a consciousness and an awareness of the natural world which is moving things forward, I think. Yeah. Well, how about your new film? You, you, you've just made a film uh, in the same way. Uh, what's that like? What's that about? How's its focus? Well, I haven't been involved in the process of making it. I've just been... Uh, it's just literally been a guy following me um, around as I have done activism. And then he himself have... I mean, he was the camera guy, the director, the sound guy, everything. And uh, yeah, he was just following me, not making too much noise. And then, yeah, they have made a film. So, but it's, it's more about me as an individual rather than the climate and the environment itself. Uh, but it also, but by doing that, they also sort of show this absurd reality that we are instead focusing on the individual on like activists like me rather than actually seeing the the problem 
uh, by portraying this absurd celebrity culture. Um, so, but also showing that this is not fair, that all this responsibility falls on, on, uh, on people like us and, and especially like children and activists to, to be able, I mean, to communicate this. Mind you, you know, you, you are now a worldwide celebrity. Has that been awkward for you? It's, it's so, it's so strange that it has become like this and that we, because I, I thought that, yeah, I might become a public figure when, when this started to become bigger. But, but I mean, it just got so, it just escalated so much and, it feels like instead of focusing on the actual fire, we are we are talking about discussing, spending all our time debating about the fire alarm, um, and that shouldn't be because that takes up all our time, and we need to be able to to move from that. And even though I understand that people like like you and me um, are bridges to to these issues and make 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 it easier for people to identify with it it's still it takes away focus from the climate crisis but i mean you have you have also um uh, you also share the, uh, the same experience how how has that affected you and and your work well uh, of course all i all i can contribute is is words to these films these days it wasn't so back in the 50s and the 60s when when i was a, a producer and i wasn't really supposed to be appearing at all and only had to because somebody else fell ill um and and then i i did what what alistair does now and, and, and did every part of it um but but since then um Television and making these films has become more and more specialised, more and more expertise. I mean, now you aren't, can't, well, I suppose you can be just a wildlife cameraman, but many of the great wildlife cameramen have become great experts. I mean, I could introduce you to a chap who's, uh, there are plenty of people who specialise in birds, but I, but there's, there's a friend of mine who, who, if you really wanted a really difficult bird to find, a really shy bird to find, you'll go to him. Um, and um, there are others who either have other specialisms, like the, there's one guy who really does nothing but ants, and the, uh, and, or, or if he had his way, that would be, <laughs> he can't get enough film about <laughs> ants. Or, or indeed, people who do time lapse of speeding up plants so you can see plants strangling one another and so on. And they are these, these great specialisms. Now, they, they weren't there 50 years ago, and now, uh, programs, uh, well, the programs I make, there could be as many as a dozen cameramen working on any one program. Um, and so I, everybody thinks, of course, that I'm, I'm there doing it myself, that I would, and so they say to you, what was it like when you suddenly uh, encountered this charging bull or, or, or elephant or whatever? And I have to say, uh, well, of course, I wasn't actually there. I was just putting on the work. And they say, yes, of course, I realize that. But what was it like? I said, I wasn't there, <laughs> you know. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so I get much more reflected glory than, than is comfortable, to be truthful. The people we are listening to us now are the people who have made these films. And it's my belief that, that the world w would not be as aware of the crisis if it wasn't for the work that they do. Um, yeah. The question is, um, is, is, is it really working? Well, I tell you, conversely, about the, I'm talking about the expert, my, my view is what you have done is that you have activated um, young people around the world, all over the place, and who are up in arms about what's happening. And if there's any sign of hope, which I think there is, to be truthful, compared with what there was 25 years ago, um, it's what, what you've done and what you've done for young people. And young people around the world are really, really going for it now because of you. So honestly, the world owes you a lot. And, and I hope you're not paying too high a price for it. But it looks to me from what you're saying that you're managing to survive all right. Yeah, well, I haven't really done that much. I mean, it's, I mean, you are such, such a loved figure by everyone. And 
you speaking up really makes all the difference, I think, because when you say it, people listen because everyone respects you so much. And, uh, and also to, to all the people attending this conference, I mean, it's, it's thanks because it's th- thanks to their work to, to a very large extent. And I think, yeah, with, without, without their work and your work, we wouldn't be where we are where we are right now but uh, uh, another thing when when i saw your your new your newest film i i was positively surprised on how how well it connected all these different issues like the climate crisis loss of di- biodiversity biodiversity and uh, loss of fertile soil and um overfishing and I mean just all these different problem problems piling up on each other because we 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 fail today so so bad to connect these issues we see it as well it's climate change and then it's this and then it's this but it, this is these are all just symptoms on one one bigger sustainability crisis and environmental crisis and we can't just tackle one we can't just tackle two because if we, if we are to tackle one, we need to tackle all of them. How, and you've been you've been very su- successful in communicating that image. How do how do you think we can make people understand more and connect these dots? Because that is what needs to be communicated right now. I quite agree, uh, and and it is a problem, and it's asking a lot after all. It's asking a lot for people who are. Uh, living uh, away from the natural world, living in cities, in the middle of cities, uh, who who don't understand so much of the way that the wild world works. So that I think that the natural history films have to have to be doing the 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 arguments that you describe, but at the same time we have a responsibility to try and explain how it is that the natural world works, why it is that if you actually make this action here, it'll have that action there, how it is if you cut down. Uh, the rainforest in 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 Brazil, uh, it could well have an effect on what's happening to the glaciers in the Arctic, you know, and and to show that this is one world, of course, being one world has produced another uh, uh, another phenomenon, I think, and, and one which is perhaps the most important thing. I mean, people say to me, you know, uh, well, what what can we do? Why can't we do something about it? We have to we have to convince our politicians, but we have to convince them not only about the reality um, of, of what's happening to the world, but the need that there should be give and take. I mean, the the, the uh, urban natures, the industrial natures of the world, uh, like ours, have uh, been taking from the natural world for the for centuries, um, and now we discover that that we. Uh, we have a big debt to other countries, which we've been taking their stuff. So now maybe the time has come that we've got to we've got to pay back, and that we, that if you're going into an international conference, the the aim that the, the delegates should have is not to come back and say we did well, we got we came out we we, we with a profit as it were, we we managed to get a good bargain. That's not the issue. Not getting a good bargain. The issue is: is the world a better place as a consequence? Um, and and that means that the, the electorate has got to have a different requirement from their politicians. And the requirement is that we've got to get agreements. That's what the real the problem is. And we, you and I, can do all that we can. In, in, well, you do more than me. I'm quite sure, actually. About with, <laughs> well, in terms of, of your personal life, I suspect you do more than I do. But uh, but the uh, and and that's very important. You have people have to have the the uh, things that they can actually physically do in terms of not wasting plastic or not wasting food or not and so on. But in the end, um, it's the world has to unite. So it's a it's the era of internationalism, not not nationalism, and um, and if our films and your film and my film and what you say and what I say has helped in that, well, that that's the very important thing, I think. I hate to butt into your uh, fantastic conversation, but there is a question that I know that everybody 
uh, ask us a lot as filmmakers, and, and I'd love you to answer. What do you think in people's own personal lives? What's the most important thing that people individually can do to help save the planet? Can I start with you on that, Greta, please? Yes. Well, there isn't one thing that is best to do. Like I said earlier, we need to do everything that we possibly can. There's not, we don't have enough, we don't have the time uh, nor the carbon budget left to uh, to argue about this is better than this and we should be doing this instead of this. But everything that we possibly can, we need to do. So, um, and I'm not telling anyone that we we need to do these things, but I mean, there, there are, I think, if I were to choose only one thing, which we, we shouldn't, but the most important thing is to... Um, to try to understand the problem, try to a educate yourself, read up on it, and spread that information to others, uh, spread the sense of we are in a crisis. And because if you understand the problem, if you fully understand the magnitude of it, then you will, you will know what you can do in your everyday life as well. And then, I mean, we need to do we need to be active democratic citizens, we need to come out on the streets, we need to put pressure on people in power um, and we need to and then there are also many many things we can do in our everyday life and uh, like going vegan stop flying stop buying new things um what else is there uh, stop i mean there's yeah there are endless things that you can do but the most important step, the introduction, is, I think, to, to understand it and to understand why these changes are, are needed. And David, if you were to choose one? I think in a sentence what I would say is don't waste in your personal life. Don't waste. Don't waste electricity. Don't waste gas. Don't waste power in any form. Don't waste food. Um, it's, it's, it's the, it's the, we're surrounded, at least I'm surrounded by luxury, you know, by anything you want. Um, and we, in, and we're encouraged to indulge ourselves. We're encouraged to want things. We should want less and less and less. And what we should, above all, is don't waste. And come to that, don't waste time. Let's get on with this particular problem. And can I ask you both whether, looking forward, you are optimists or pessimists for the future of our planet? Greta, how do you feel about it? Uh, neither. I am a realist. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you very much. All I can say is ditto. No, I absolutely agree. I mean... To people, it, it's, it's, it's not an uncommon question. People say, are oh, you an optimist or a pessimist? What's that got to do with it? Um, yeah. uh, how, who is this genius who can evaluate way on the one hand we've got this and on the other hand we've not that? And this is this way is a bit more, this is more likely than that. It can't, you can't do it. All you can know is we've got an urgent problem. We have to get on with it as, as fast as we can. I don't know what you think that the, the virus has, has done to it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm worried that it takes that people will take their eyes off, off the environmental issues because of the immediate problems that they have on, them, on, on COVID. And of course, it's put off. The, the series of COP conferences uh, that, in which you, all the nations get together and, and, and talk. I got a letter from somebody the other day and said, I'm fed up with these politicians talking. What they should do, they, there was some issue in Africa, I remember a long time ago, in which the leaders are put in a room and, and you know, they said, we won't let you out until you come to an agreement. Well, that's all very well if, in fact, um, or, just, or, or uh, that is effective if, in fact, the so-called leaders are to totalitarian because they can just go in, say, swinging, take swinging decisions. But you, you can't do that in a democratic society. In a democratic society, the electorate has to decide whether they want to follow you or not. So that what you are doing, and I hope what I'm doing, and what everybody's listening to us is doing, is to form um, a, a body of, of active 
opinion demand, as you demand, and so effectively, that the that the the politicians do something about this sort of thing, that we understand that it could cost taxes, that we understand that that if we are really going to share the thing, we're going to give up as well as take. We understand that we really have to get. I mean, one of the most obvious things it seems to me is is the oceans. I mean, it is plain. Any fool can see that you can't go on fishing forever and ever. Any fool can see that you've got to actually stop at some stage and allow fishing stocks to recover, and that requires agreements. And that requires somebody saying, "Yes, okay, we understand. We had it good here, but we will under- stop that. We are doing it, and we have to give things up as well as take." And it's, um, I mean, I, 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 I don't envy a politician trying to negotiate these things through. But dear politicians, the electorate is that now I think through what you are saying and what we all are saying, and everybody who's, who's in this, um, uh, in, in, in wild screen is saying, is we understand that actually protecting the world means we have to be less selfish. And if you if you make laws that that cost us, but it are demonstrably good for the environment, we'll accept that. And I think Greta, that's what you've been demonstrating. No, I mean that's that's what we all are trying to do to to raise public awareness, to create public opinion. It is, after all, public opinion which runs the free world, and that is one of the biggest sources of hope right now. That if people become Aware, if enough people become aware, and if, if enough people put enough pressure on, on people in power, on the elected officials, then, then they will have to do something because a politician's job is to, to get elected and to do as the voters ask, uh, as the voters want, um, and so right now we need to, to spread awareness to make to build up that public opinion and that public pressure. So, and that's why, why conferences like, like these, when we, when the purpose is to, to spread awareness, to spread information, knowledge, and to, to communicate, to communicate feelings or information or whatever it might be. This is so important because that that's the most efficient tool we have the media to to influence people may i ask you both one last question please um greta what be, would be the advice of your generation the younger generation to david's generation the older generation maybe that uh, yes we we know you have much more experience than than we have and we know that you are more educated than we are and that you understand the world in in a different way but we we still need to keep we need to keep an open mind this is a crisis that requires us keeping an open mind and thinking outside the box so um and that is one of the many things that i admire with with you david that you 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 are keeping such an open mind and i don't know how you do it but you you still are very you you still learn and take in new things and and keep an open mind so that's that's i think my advice from my generation to to the older generations that keep an open mind just because we have always done this way doesn't mean it is right doesn't mean it is morally defendable and david how about you convincing her in the end it has to be a political decision that we're going to save the world it has to be that there is give and take between nations and the electorate people like you and me and greta and we must persuade people that we back them on the policies that have been loosely called green. Um, and fair play, uh, in this country at least, in, in Britain, there have been statements from the government about backing green policies, backing policies uh, that are taking more and more power from, from renewables. Uh, and and there have been other policies too about 
looking after our seas and so on. And they have been making statements which um, give you hope. Uh, and I just hope that they really come into play. It's, uh, if you're faced with a crisis of, of, of this, the proportions of the epidemic we're facing, it's very difficult to lift your eyes from immediate problems and from immediate problems in hospitals to think about what the like is, life is like in another five years' time. But we have to do that. We really, really have to do that. And I just, I, I think the future of the world depends on it. David, Greta, thank you so much. Um, it's been an amazing privilege sitting here in Bristol, listening to this very special, this very unique conversation between you two. If you want to catch up with those movies, Greta's movie, I Am Greta, was released on Hulu on the 16th of October in the UK, and it'll be released on the November the 13th in the States. While David's movie, David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet, is already streaming on Netflix. Thank you very much for watching. And stay tuned if you'd like to see the trailers for both those movies. Thank you.